when you get to take it Good evening, welcome to Monash Chambers. My name is Damien Carrick. I present the Law Report, which is the weekly legal current affairs show on ABC Radio National. On behalf of the Caspian Centre for Human Rights Law at Monash University, welcome to this Freedom Forum. This evening's event forms part of an impressive ongoing series of conversations organised by the centre, which focus on cutting edge legal and human rights issues. Now, the Caspian Centre will be tweeting throughout the event, and if you're interested in following along on Twitter, the hashtag is #CCFreedom, and apparently it's posted up on the wall in case you um. Oh, terrific! Yeah, fantastic. Now, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Freedom, it's the new buzzword in Australian politics. But what does it actually mean? And what does the government mean when it says freedom? Following its election in 2013, the Abbott government appointed a new Human Rights Commissioner, Tim Wilson, with a specific remit to consider the issue of freedom. Mr Wilson has become colloquially known as the Freedom Commissioner. In addition, the government has initiated an inquiry by the Australian Law Reform Commission to review how well traditional rights, freedoms and privileges are protected in Australian law. The Attorney General, George Brandis, acknowledges that much of this focus stems from the controversial Andrew Bolt racial discrimination case and also a belief that anti-discrimination laws sometimes unduly limit freedom. This forum this evening will look at what freedom means in Australia and how it can be better protected and also whether existing laws really do limit our freedoms. We have three terrific speakers for you this evening. Professor Sarah Joseph, Joe Caputo and also Professor Wendy Bacon. Now, the plan this evening is that each will talk for 15 minutes, and then we'll have a conversation for about 15 minutes, teasing out some of the ideas that they've raised. And after that, we'll have about 15 minutes for your questions. Our first speaker is Professor Sarah Joseph. She's the director of the Caston Centre, and her latest research includes writing on the areas of media reform, social media, and human rights. And you can also follow her on Twitter at at Prof Sarah J. That's at Prof P R O F S A R A H J. Would you please make her welcome? greater freedom and we do have a new freedom commissioner Mr Tim Wilson and writing in January the Attorney General George Brandis described freedom as the most fundamental of all human rights but as Damien said what in fact does freedom mean? George Brandis and Tim Wilson espouse the classical freedom from the government where human activity is best regulated by voluntary interactions in the free market of societal relations rather than by the state. Regulation by the state, in contrast, is felt to be inherently oppressive or too efficient or too expensive. Now, freedoms from the government are extremely important, but there are other important aspects to freedom. There is freedom in I think a more, a more practical sense or a more lived sense and that is of being able or free to do the things that one wants to do. And with, you know, without being glib, it is easier to do such things if one is rich and powerful but harder if one is vulnerable or disadvantaged. The rich and the powerful have greater capacities and capabilities. Now certainly sometimes that is due to hard work and talent but sometimes it's not. And similarly, the lack of opportunities or capacities and capabilities is not necessarily due to the lack of hard work and talent. The fact is that the market, the so-called market, does not fairly allocate freedoms in this sense that I've just portrayed it, as it pays no attention to pre-existing power relations and capabilities. Such an approach to freedom, I would argue, if it's adopted exclusively, protects the strong but offers far less for others. 
Now, the classical freedoms from the government, um, I think largely espoused by um, Tim Wilson and George Brandis, correspond in human rights language or international human rights language to what are called negative rights. And this is where the government should refrain from interfering with people, should refrain from interfering with their rights, such as their freedom of speech, their freedom of association, and so on. Uh, this is known as the government's duty to respect rights and freedoms. So those are negative rights, but there also are also positive rights, where governments are required or should take positive steps, proactive steps, to promote freedoms and rights. And so governments should take steps to protect people, to protect people's freedoms from interference from other people. And I would say an example of this is the enactment, the proactive enactment of anti-discrimination law. Anti-discrimination law prevents people from being deprived of freedoms, that is in the sense of opportunities, um, on irrelevant grounds such as race or gender. And you know, when I say opportunities, I mean opportunities or freedoms to work, for housing, for access to access goods and services. If you can't do that, you're not enjoying a lot of freedom. Further, governments must act to fulfill human rights sometimes. They must provide for certain rights when a person is for a variety of reasons, unable to do so for themselves. For example, welfare payments prevent marginalised people from living in, gr in grinding poverty in this very wealthy country. One of the worst, I mean, there are many, obviously, terrible aspects to poverty, but one of them is a serious lack of practical freedom and opportunity. The poor have greatly decreased capacities and practical freedoms compared to people who are not poor. This broader version of free freedom is not catered for simply by the government getting out of the way in the sense that classical liberals favour. And so it will be interesting to see how this aspect of freedom or this seriously debilitating lack of freedom, how that is addressed by this government. Now, another point I want to make is about, about the government's focus on freedom is the way that our Attorney General has talked about, quote, traditional rights and freedoms. In doing so, he seems to be distinguishing such rights from the most prominent modern, you know, rights, traditional rights and freedoms from the most prominent modern discourse on rights, which is international human rights law. But what are these traditional rights and freedoms and where do they come from? Now, both Tim Wilson and George Brandis have distinguished human rights from human rights law. They say that our freedom springs from our innate humanity and they're harking back to the Age of Enlightenment. Now, that's all fair enough, but the fact is that ultimately the practical, you know, one, the extent of our freedom is at least partly determined by law. Now, I would argue Tim Wilson seems to favour a fairly absolutist version of free speech, and that's actually more indicative of the US tradition than the Australian tradition. Um, US law actually facilitates a uniquely strong version of free speech, stronger than anywhere else I know of, certainly stronger than Australia or the UK or Canada or Europe. Um, just as an example, hate speech is not only not banned, it's not banned in the US, it's actually constitutionally protected. In contrast, the Attorney General, I believe his reference to traditional rights and freedoms, that seems to be more about Australia's common law traditions. And this seems evident in his reference to the Australian Law Reform Commission. Um, the Attorney General has asked the Law Reform Commission to conduct an audit of federal laws to uncover statu you know, to talk to uncover statutory encroachments on freedom. Um, now, if one believes that the common law is a great protector of freedom, that also lessens arguments um, that Australia should get some sort of charter or bill of rights. That's that's a separate issue, and I won't go into that. Um, obviously, that's a long-standing debate. Now, in this reference to the Law Reform Commission, George Brandis has included a list of so-called common law freedoms, and it's a it's a pretty interesting list. It's dominated by fair trial rights, and that's fair enough. I think historically the common law has been a strong protector of various procedural fair trial rights. Um, the same applies to property rights. The common law has been the friend of people with property. There's not a lot of redistribution going on in the common law. Missing, and this is interesting, is freedom from arbitrary detention, um, which is in fact a long-standing common law right in the form of the writ of habeas corpus. I suspect that is because we have detained many asylum seekers for many years. Um, but I'm interested in particular in the inclusion on this list of freedom of expression, freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, and freedom of religion. Um, that these are cited as traditional common law rights, because I'm actually sceptical of whether that is the case. 
In fact, I'm skeptical that the common law has traditionally been a strong protector of human rights and freedoms. Um, in fact, there are instances of the common law being a terrible protector of human rights and freedoms. Um, a fairly notorious case from 1976 is Dugan and the Mirror Newspapers. Darcy Dugan was um, a fairly famous Australian criminal. He was sentenced to death in 1950 and that sentence was later commuted. 25 years later, he tried to sue a newspaper, but um, the common law doctrine of civil death was applied to him. Um, it was an old common law rule that anyone who was sentenced to death was therefore legally dead and had no civil right to sue in court. So there's not a lot of attention there to any notion of equality under the law um, in that case. Now, a more promising case might be another case from the same year, from the UK, the Malone case. It uncovered a freedom, but this particular freedom was the freedom of the police to bug a person's house. Um, it was not that long ago that the common law allowed a man to rape his wife. And in fact, traditionally, women have had a terrible deal under the common law. Uh, more recently, courts in the UK in the 1980s um, seemed to bend over backwards to develop the common law in such a way to come up with all sorts of ways to stop minors from um, joining strikes around the country. And this was during um, the time of the very famous and um, very uh, controversial minor strikes, um, a battle between the Thatcher government and the miners' unions. And again, not a lot of respect there for freedom of association. In fact, I was a master's student in the UK in the early 1990s, and that's where I was taught that the common law, in the home of the common law, I was taught it was not a good protector of human rights. Now, in 1993, maybe 1992, this, I can, I can concede that started to change. There was a case called the Derbyshire County Council case where a local council uh, attempted to sue someone for defamation. And it was decided that at common law, uh, local government authorities had no rights to sue for defamation. And this was treated as a victory for free speech, and I think correctly so. And it was also treated in the UK, I was there at the time, as a sort of hallelujah moment for the common law. Finally, the common law is protecting human rights. And I think there might even be parallels to the hallelujah moment here, quite a different one um, uh, with regard to the common law in the form of the Mabo case. So perhaps the common law has become a friend, or at least a better friend of human rights and freedoms since 1993. Um, certainly, the lawyers among you would be aware of the so-called principle of legality, under which statutes should be interpreted as far as possible, so as not to infringe common law rights. But I would argue the principle of legality has experienced a huge revival in the last decade or so, and was largely dormant for many decades before that. So, Brandis's reference to these traditional rights and, forum, uh, rights and freedoms, I would say that they're kind of 20 years old. That's actually not that long a tradition. Now, a more worrying aspect, or a worrying aspect, of this focus on traditional rights, in my view, is that it seems that the Attorney General may want to redefine human rights for the purposes of the Australian Human Rights Commission. He signalled a change to the legislation, but he hasn't actually told us what form that will take. But he has appointed Tim Wilson, and he has colloquially called him the Freedom Commissioner. But in reality, at least at the moment, he's the Human Rights Commissioner. And as the person in that position, he is supposed to uphold the rights in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. That's his statutory role. But Tim Wilson has made it clear he doesn't agree with at least some of the rights in that treaty, including broad-based freedom from discrimination and freedom from hate speech. So um, I do hope that there isn't a plan to somehow reduce the scope of human rights and freedoms um, to the narrower scope that are recognised in the common law rather than um, the international law standards upon which it's currently based. Now, my final point um, is to note that the government's approach to freedom, and even in that narrow classical liberal sense, I would argue is inconsistent and hypocritical. It doesn't include, for example, the freedom to marry a same-sex partner, the freedom to die voluntarily with dignity, freedom from the Northern Territory intervention, or freedom from random spying by a friendly foreign government. It detains dozens of recognised refugees indefinitely on the basis of information that it doesn't allow them to seek, which is a clear departure from human rights, but also common law rights of due process. The Attorney General has openly supported Queensland's draconian biking laws, which are a shocking assault on classical notions of freedom associations. Now, freedom can, freedoms can clash. And a running theme, I think, for this government is that such clashes are often resolved in favour of commercial interests. 
Uh, just uh, last week, Senator Richard Colbeck from Tasmania, he's the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Agriculture, he suggested that laws might be amended to ban many environmental boycotts of business. Now, he denies any consequent harm to free speech, but at the same time he argues that campaigners, quote, should not be able to run a specific business-focused or market-focused campaign. And we've already seen that this government has a certain distaste for boycotts, um, given the reaction by George Brandis as the Arts Minister to the Sydney Biennale um, boycott. Um, since then, he has directed the Australia Council to cut funding to arts groups which, quote, unreasonably refuse corporate sponsorship, which seems to be creating, if you like, an inalienable right to sponsor, which prevails over the rights of artists to freedom of conscience. And I would argue that art is not apolitical or value-free. The best is opinionated, not craven and cowed. The conditioning of government funding on depoliticised behaviour is inimical to freedom. It leads to a skewed public sphere of debate where the privately funded have enormous freedom to express opinions while the publicly funded are muzzled. And as a final example, let me mention Australia's outdated copyright law, which I would argue fails us in the new frontier for free speech, which is its application in the digital environment. The Law Reform Commission recently recommended the adoption of a more flexible defence to copyright breach um, of so-called fair use defence. But the Attorney General has indicated that he sides with the content holders, and if so, that means no change. But I would argue that he is misguided if he thinks that his position supports business. Google could not be based here. Wikipedia could not be based here. Facebook could not be based here. They are based in the US, which has a fair use copyright defence, which encourages innovation. And so I would say that our current copyright law is bad for freedom in many senses, political, social, informational, cultural, and commercial. So in conclusion, I believe that Australia's freedom debate is dominated by a narrow and inconsistently applied definition of freedom. And I think it's also been dominated by the freedom to be a bigot, and I do believe this is a development which in the future will be seen as completely bizarre. Real freedom is far more complex, and real freedom will be jeopardised unless that freedom, unless that complexity is recognised and respected. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. We might just try and move this um, lectern just over a little bit so we don't get the um, the, uh, the noise happening. Like we're on a ship in the 18th century. Be <laughs> with us. Thank you, Sarah. Our next speaker is Joe Caputo. He is the chair of the Federation of Ethnic Communities Council of Australia. Joe has been involved in advocacy for the rights of minorities throughout all his adult life. During the 70s and 80s, he was involved in promoting the rights of migrant workers. And from 2001 to 2011, he was a member of the Victorian Multicultural Commission. Joe's also served as a councillor and mayor in the former city of Brunswick and also as a councillor and a mayor in the current city of Moreland. Which please go, Joe Caputo, welcome. Let's see if I can do the dancing as well to see if I thank you, Damien. Um, I too would like to acknowledge uh, that we're meeting in the land of the Kulin Nation and uh, the Wurundjeri people and pay my respect to the to the elders past and present. I would also like to thank the Customs Centre for Human Rights. It is a pleasure to participate in this forum. But firstly, let me uh, tell you a little bit about, my, about myself. I was born uh, in Italy, in the southern part of Italy, in the region of Puglia. At the age of seven, together with my mother and siblings, we left uh, Italy to join my dad who had migrated to Brazil in the early 1950s. During the 1960s, Brazil went through a major political and economic upheavals 
So my family decided to move once again, and in the mid-60s, as a teenager, we moved to Melbourne, where we settled. My grandfather, before my father, had migrated to the United States in, in 1918. So soon after the First World War. So for me and my family, we experienced migration, three generations in three uh, continents. I can tell you by my own experience that migration was not a free choice, was not a free choice for us. It was a sheer survival and the harsh realities of wars, poverty and intolerance that forced my grandfather, my father and the rest of uh, our family to travel the world in search for a better life. When we arrived in Melbourne in the mid-60s, the, the local environment was not very welcoming to strangers. We soon learned that uh, whilst travelling on public transport or relaxing in public places, that we could not, have, could, could not have had a private conversation in our own language without somebody shout, shouting at us to stop talking world language and speak English or go back where, you, where we came from. Things have radically uh, changed since those days. Australia has become a, a tower of Babel and people are free to speak in any language of their choices and very rarely in the, in today someone abuses them for doing so, although this still happens and we see that in our daily newspapers. We no longer have a a wide Australian policy. We have a special broadcasting service that speaks in tongues. Our government uh, became signature to international covenants that led to the setting of various human rights uh, acts, you know, such as the equal opportunity, race discrimination, etc. I have lived uh, through this career. There was only a I was not only a spectator, but an activist protesting and agitating for changes throughout this time. I have been an activist advocating for the rights of minorities for the best part of 40 years. In all of this time, and to this very day, my involvement has been on a voluntary basis. In November of last, uh, of last year, I was elected chair of the Federation of Ethnic Communities Council of Australia. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Federation of Ethnic Communities Council of Australia, Australia of FECA, we are a peak national body representing Australians from cultural, linguistic, diverse backgrounds. Nationally, we have um, several hundreds of affiliated organizations that range from Scots, Irish, and to our new and emerging recently arrived communities from, from Asia and Africa. Of course, uh, as you all know, everyone is of some ethnic background, and by that definition, uh, you could say that we are one of the most representative organizations in Australia. Our role is to advocate and promote issues on behalf of our constituency towards ensuring the needs and aspirations of Australians from diverse communities are given proper recognition in public policy. Today, uh, Australia is one of the most diverse and cultural rich uh, nations in the world. We identify with 300 different ancestries and, and speak just as many uh, languages. But the concept of multiculturalism is, is certainly not new, not, nor is it unique to Australia's con con contemporary situation and demographic uh, makeup. Australia has always uh, been multicultural long before the arrival of Europeans who brought with them the institution of Western government and statehood. Aboriginals, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands communities are incredible multicultural and have always reflected this through uh, their social and cultural traditions, speaking different languages, following different belief systems, and doing so peacefully and harmoniously for centuries prior to European settlement. It is important to note, however, that whilst multiculturalism has always strived, it is the leadership and wisdom of the decision towards progressive social 
and multicultural policy that allowed our society to harmoniously develop and prosper. Our unique modern uh, Australian multicultural policy started in the 1970s with the abolishing of uh, the white Australian policy by the Whitlam administration and consolidated by the, the Fraser government with the, the setting up of major infrastructures in settlement services. History tells us that uh, this was not accomplished easily with many ups and downs and, all, uh, and many ups and downs along the way and it took a great deal of energy, passion and passion to achieve the, the, the broad acknowledgement of the benefit of multiculturalism ranging from increased economic development to improved community cohesion and strength of social values. This is what makes uh, our contemporary achievement in, multi in, in the multicultural sector so profound and why building on, uh, on this achievement and taking a more positive step forward are so worth the fight. With the federal government plans to repeal its current form, uh, form for, uh, form the Protection Against the Racial Vilification in the Racial Discrimination Act, it's important to remind ourselves of the road that has so far been traveled in upholding equality and non-discrimination as the core values of, of our cultural, of, of cultural diversity. It uh, took years of consideration and debate to introduce a provision against, against racial vilification balanced by a number of exemptions in the RDA. The provision were required to address, uh, to address the situation of escalating racial violence against both Australia's first people and more recent immigrants by bridging the gaps in the racial discrimination legislation. Essentially, the provision set clear limits and established, uh, established accountability under the law for racist offensive remarks and hate speech. Advocates of multiculturalism, including myself, believe that racial vilification provision to be, to be critical in upholding equality and eliminating intolerance in Australia's cultural diverse society. A couple of weeks ago, uh, the Attorney General sent us a clear message about the society the government believes we want to live in, embodied in the Freedom of Speech Bill 2014. The bill would repeal nearly the entire Section 18 of the Racial Discrimination Act 1975 and replace it with a provision geared largely towards protection of free speech at the expense of protection against racial discrimination. The most concern of the proposed change are the exemption now significantly broader and no longer meant to, to be done reasonable and in good faith that would virtually reduce the provision to note. With the public discourse completely excluded from the provisions, what is meant to be understood by otherwise than private? Offend, insult, and humiliated would be replaced by with the vilify, complemented by intimidate, both defined very uh, narrow, narrowly. Finally, the changes would introduce a, a community test to, a, to assess whether an act would constitute vilification or intimidation. Apart from lacking uh, definitional clarity, the test in itself is discriminatory as it implies that a particular group within the Australian community are not what ordinary reasonable members of the Australian community. Over the past months, indigenous and ethnic community organizations have been urging the government to maintain strong protection against racial vilification and discrimination. With the well-substantiated concern repeatedly voiced by, by people across Australia who have been impacted by racial abuse and hostility and have had to endure the mental effects, it is extremely disappointing that, only, that the only person heard in the debate was a journalist from a Melbourne Daily newspaper framing the debate around one case, in fact around one person, is inappropriate and disrespectful of many Australians from diverse backgrounds who experience race, race, uh, race, racial vilification and hatred on a day-to-day -day basis. 
it will be a, attention to uh, to occasional high profile cases around racial racial unification. It is easy to forget that many Australians from diverse backgrounds experience racial vilification and hatred on a day-to-day -day basis. With the ongoing need for a legal provision, who is going to protect uh, victims when perpetrators or racist hate speech realize that the law is on their side? Are we prepared to deal with the consequence of such a legislative change? Everyone who believes that their Australian society should be free from discrimination, everyone who's experienced or witnessed, witnessed racial, racial hatred, hatred and abuse should make their views known to the government as part of the consultation process. We have until the 30th of this month to express our views and how we feel about taking us back to the good old days. The issue of freedom is most relevant to an informed debate on, the, on, the, on this subject. It is freedom, specific, specifically the freedom of speech that has driven millions of immigrants, like my family, from all over the world to make Australia their home. Is there a price to pay for freedom of speech? Absolutely. Should it include tolerating racism? I don't think not. We're considering the balance of freedom in the RDA with our due consideration of community needs the government risks eroding the proud legacy of our harmonious multiculturalism and its advocates in the recent Australian history. We have come uh, too far to fight an unnecessary battle, you know, about the needs to exercise caution and care when making decisions that potentially diminish rather than strengthen the fundamental value that are at the heart of a successful multicultural nation. I, in conclusion, I would like to say that I fear that the action of this government in wanting to water down the RDA may result in weakening our record of national unity. In this time, when we all should be doing our utmost in ensuring that ethnic and religious sectarianism uh, do not prevail, we should be doing more, not less, to say to people that it's not acceptable to be racist. Thank you very much. is Professor Wendy Bacon. She's the professorial, she's a professorial fellow at the Australian Centre for Independent Journalism at UTS in Sydney. She's a renowned media researcher and a renowned investigative journalist and she has a long history of activism around free speech issues. <coughs> Wendy Bacon. Damien, and uh, thank you to the Kesson Centre for inviting me to speak tonight. And I too would like to acknowledge the original owners and still the owners of this land. Um, freedom is an abstract notion, but as Joe and Sarah have already, I think, um, explained, it is also a lived material experience that needs to be defended and fought for every day in different contexts. Um, I note that um, at the weekend, uh, one of the Sunday papers in Sydney revealed that the uh, Department of uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet Department were going to take away from public servants, uh, if they ever had a right, but anyway, they're going to make it very clear that they couldn't do any uh, social media or even anonymous social media and that they should dog in their mates, um, actively exhorting public servants to um, implement uh, the changes that would take away um, at least the perceived freedom. I note that Tim Wilson uh, has no problems with this. In fact, he thinks you, you just resign if you do. And I think also that Tim Wilson probably doesn't have seen much role for the public in any case, which just goes to show that he has a very different notion of freedom than I have. I think actually simplistic debates about freedom and just treating freedom as if it is some abstract notion um, can lead us down many blind alleys. 
Uh, tonight, I mostly want to speak about free speech, but of course, free speech is connected to all other sorts of freedoms. Now, my own conception of free speech is one that is situated within the notions of a democratic public sphere, that acknowledges the threat of state power, everything from censorship to secrecy to petty regulations, but also recognises private power and cultural power and the threat that that can be to freedom. It also recognises the crucial role that I believe journalism plays in a democracy and that for that we need some rights to be journalists, proper journalists. But it also means that we have some accountabilities to the public. But I also believe that citizens have a right to information and also that if citizens are denied a public voice, that will affect the exercise of all other democratic rights. Speech is linked to other forms of action, assembly, access of information, and the right to speech also implies the right to silence. Now, my own ideas have developed over, I guess, my entire adulthood and even before that because I wanted to live in a speech at my school way back in the 1960s that was effectively banned. So, uh, but my main experiences are uh, really developed out of being a student editor in the very early 70s and out of the 1960s experience. And at that time, of course, and some of you, a few of you will remember this, how much censorship we really had in Australia, how many books were banned, how much self-censorship there was. And so through a direct action campaign, uh, the paper that I was associated with, Saranka, along with many, many other papers in Melbourne and elsewhere, we broke through those laws through direct action. And I actually believe that whatever legal frameworks are put in place to protect or deny free speech, that it has to be fought for and that direct action does have a part to play. Um, look, what I learned then, actually, in, in, during those campaigns, apart from the fact you can end up in prison sometimes, but um, which was a surprise to me back then, uh, but also that um, censorship will be applied, censorship laws like obscenity laws will be applied to, to protect special interest groups. And at the time we were only prosecuted, I really think because of the pressure from within the Catholic Church. And uh, it's interesting now to, to realise through the Royal Commission of Child Abuse that of course the time when all this um, pressure was being brought on to, to limit uh, the alternative press, a whole lot of horrific crimes were being conducted secretly, sec secretly within institutions. And I also learned that, of course, prosecutions are selective, so it was fine to publish pornography at King's Cross, but not to link sexuality with violence in the pages of a student newspaper. Now, I later went on to be um, a full-time journalist at Channel 9 and then the National Times. And actually, along with the journalist that sadly passed away, Andrew Ollie, we did the first program on the Sunday program about an Aboriginal person, young person, who died in custody. And after that program, Kerry Packer, Packer who then owned the network, rang up and said to a person who worked at Channel 9, uh, do not ever show a program like that on my station again. Now, to give him credit, the executive producer did reproduce um, that program at the end of the year. But on the other hand, we didn't get that extra editing suite that we badly needed the following year and had to lose stuff. At the National Times, which was a weekly investigative paper owned by Fairfax, um, I experienced that defamation threats could arrive nearly every week. Every article had to be legaled. Threats were, um, writs were rare, or not, actually writs that were acted upon were rare, that uh, the government and also big business people could withdraw advertising, advertising if they didn't like what, what you wrote, and also that contempt of parliament could be used, um, as it was against uh, myself and Brian Tui, uh, to sustain political cover-ups and shut down stories. And I saw too that the Labor government, when it became angry with the corruption exposures, uh, reshaped the media laws with this, um, as they did when they allowed Rupert Murdoch to buy the Herald and Weekly Times in 1987. And that has had continuing damaging impacts on our democratic uh, public sphere. Now, all that was my sort of lived experience, as was when I was in Victoria Street, uh, which was being demolished at that time. That was another. 
a struggle. Uh, Juanita Nielsen, who had a small local paper that was opposing the development, got literally disappeared. So I'd had a fair few experiences. It was really only when I arrived at UTS to teach uh, journalism and media law in the early 90s that I think I really um, began to think through concepts of free speech. And um, tomorrow on my blog I will put some references here, but uh, I was very influenced at the time by John Keane, who's now at Sydney University, a professor of political philosophy, who wrote, to, um, wrote the history of, of Thomas Paine, actually, a great free speech activist, um, but also uh, wrote a very powerful thing that we gave to every journalism student um, at the time, which critiqued um, that original, those original battles and arguments for free speech in the light of um, the fact that there was never, and there never has been, an equal playing field. And so much of our free speech and freedom theory was developed, as Sarah has, has explained probably more eloquently than this, that uh, lies in notions of individual property rights. And I also Paul Jones, a sociologist, who talked about the community of public sphere. And Lawrence McNamara, who contributed a, a chapter on free speech to a major textbook sitting over there on the table. Um, uh, drawing on the ideas of Fred Shaw, who was the um, free speech um, uh, the f professor for the First Amendment at Harvard University, who came out here to Australia after our free speech cases in the early 90s and said, but hang on here, free speech theory needs to take account of, of private power. And uh, that really did get me thinking quite a lot and really, uh, I guess, contributed to that conception that I spoke out at the, um, at the beginning of this speech. Now, I'd just like to mention briefly two um, key areas. Uh, Sarah has mentioned the terrorism laws, also the appalling secrecy and the lack of freedom to report that is going along with our asylum seekers and detention centres. And that deserves a whole forum on its own. But I thought I would mention both the shield laws and the defamation laws because they, uh, they sort of affect my work um, every day. Now, just recently, um, just recently, um, I've been doing a small story. Um, it's actually about um, a place in Sydney called the Paddington Bowling Club. And uh, the residents there live near a park, and part of the open space has got a, a bowling club on it. And at the moment, the uh, Labor government and then the Liberal government handed over this uh, club to a property developer, and as a consequence of that, they're about to lose part of their open space. So a small group is fighting quite a privileged group actually, not lacking in resources, is trying to get some coverage and trying to fight this removal of their freedom to use this space. So they, um, you know, try to get a story done, no space, no this journalists, and this is a chronic, uh, this is in fact a threat to um, the free speech, is the lack of journalism resources. So they come to me as a, I guess you would say, retired journalist, and so I um, researched this issue. Um, my story was legal by a very competent uh, lawyer and uh, published on the online independent website New, New Matilda. Now, a couple of days after this, a letter arrived uh, by email from me and uh, New Matilda saying, um, saying, one, take it down and never publish it again. Secondly, and that includes any archiving of it. Um, apologise and pay our costs. Now, um, I can't go into exactly why this happened. It has something to do with some insurance lawyers who certainly didn't talk to me about the article. And as a consequence of that, New Matilda, small publication, not a lot of resources. I'm not critical of them for this, but they took the article down. Now, that left me with the capacity at having the means of production to publish it on my blog, as I continue to do with three stories. Now, I wrote back to this lawyer who'd written to me, who just happens to be the person who witnessed the transfer of the lease, the Crown lease from the club to the pro property developer, and said, well, look, first of all, I'm not aware of any inaccuracies in the article. Secondly, I don't think it's defamatory. And uh, thirdly, um, I can't remember if I said anything else, but anyway, he certainly didn't get back to me. He still hasn't, so I'm continuing to publish. So. Last 
last week there was a meeting finally of this Paddington Bowling Club that doesn't file any financial accounts with ASIC. You can't find out anything about that because ASIC won't comment on operational matters, just like um, the latest version of the Immigration Department won't comment on anything that's in operational matters. So I couldn't find out too much more about that. So uh, they had a meeting and I rang someone who I knew was at the meeting and I spoke to them. Now I spoke to them off the record. As an investigative journalist, and this is where shield laws come in, I have never ever done a story as an investigative journalist where I have not had to guarantee my one source at least the right to speak confidentially to me so their voice could be heard. This is a critical right if people are to do watchdog journalism uh, of, of any kind. So I spoke to this person off the record and uh, then I needed to confirm it so I thought well I'll ring the president of the club, the new president. So I rang him and uh, he then abused me on the phone and said, very disappointed in your articles, we've written to UTS to complain about you because you're an employee, which I'm not. And uh, so uh, it's in the hands of our solicitors and it's in the hands of uh, senior counsel and you'll be hearing from us. Now, you know, I'm not actually that worried about that, but you just have to sort of consider that I've got a media law background. I've also, um, in a position where I feel able to do things like this. But most people, most groups, most people in the community, most of the resident activist group, citizens in Wallara, let alone in many other parts of Sydney, would feel severely intimidated. So I would say, and I find it very interesting that people who are arguing for the reform of ACNC, which you know really came about this whole debate because some Aboriginal people used collectively a right they had under the law. I find it very interesting that people say, well, why didn't they use the defamation law? One, it's very much an individualistic exercise. Secondly, it costs a lot of money. And um, I actually think it would be a retrograde step that people don't, and it's interesting that people don't see uh, the defamation laws as a problem. So um, I, I will finish with that. But I wanted to end on a note that I think that if we want to protect free speech, we have to take actions to actively give people a voice. And just this week, um, uh, Melissa Sweet, who is a journalist of something called Croaky Blog, who is really actively trying to give people a voice in the public health sector, she um, organised a campaign for an uh, Aboriginal writer called Kelly Briggs in Moree, a very, very disadvantaged place in New South Wales, so that a crowdsourced um, campaign, so that she could actually have a voice and write about what she wants to write is the, the everyday experiences of Aboriginal people that take away their freedom to have lives as long as many other citizens have. And it seems to me that is an excellent act in favour of freedom. And I would so much rather put my energy into that than worrying about giving Andrew Bolt a little bit more power than he already has. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, I think my job here is to maybe ask a few provocative questions and to tease and test some of the uh, things that have been put today. Um, but first of all, maybe an easier question, um, I'm wondering if each of the three of you could give me a definition of freedom because, because I think what you're all suggesting in very different ways, and it's great to hear it in three very different ways, is that an individual's right to free speech is only part of an individual's ability to effectively participate in the public square conversation. You're saying that there are lots of other things at play, there's money, there's power, there's access, and they somehow need to be acknowledged and addressed when we're talking about a big picture notion of freedom. So, Sarah, if I can start with you. That's big question. question. <laughs> but I want a short answer, then I want to ask some difficult questions. Um, okay. I mean, one, okay, well, I'm going to give two aspects. One is just to reiterate what you just said about having the ability to participate, which is not just speaking, but just to participate in the 
social and cultural and political life of the society you happen to live in. But I suppose the aspect I was talking about when I was talking about capacities and capabilities is even you know, the freedom to have the opportunity to, to fulfil the destiny that you want for yourself. So long as, you know, I mean, obviously within limits. I mean, if your destiny is that you want to be a murderer, that's obviously probably extremely problematic. But most people don't have that wish. Most people have a wish to live some sort of decent life, but we all have different, different conceptions of what that might be. And to have that chance, not everyone will. In fact, most people in the world won't even get close. But that is probably real for you. Wendy. Well, I think um, for me, freedom is uh, not to be constrained from actions that you want to take, but also to be able to envisage the possibility of taking actions and to take um, positive actions. Um, I very much agree with what um, Sarah's saying in, in putting it in a broader notion of rights. I think you know the problem with definitions is that they uh, they almost become meaningless because I guess my main point about freedom is it really does have to be seen in the context of social relations and power relations and in the context of particular issues. Sure. After hearing uh, you know, what Sarah and Wendy, uh, look, I, I, I agree with both the um, definition. My, uh, I think we all are um, we come from the experience that we had, that we, you know, that we bring to the to, to, to the discussion. Uh, freedom for me is the, the, the ability for people to live in peace and do all of the other things that what Wendy and uh, and Sarah have mentioned as well. Uh, without that capacity, then we, uh, you know, we, we don't have very much to go by. So that that would be my, uh, you know, my view of the ideal society that. Uh, that of every individual to be able to live in peace. But again, I mean, I don't believe in absolute freedom. So I think that there has to be, you know, sort of conditioned by and uh, and they have to be, um, there to be a, a, an agreement within the society whereby, you know, uh, you, you have to then not do things to hurt, in other words, you the other fellow human beings. Mm. Well, well, let's talk about that absolute freedom of speech, that idea. Um, a difficult case for me. Um, Adelaide Holocaust denier Frederick Tobin. Many years ago, he was found guilty of having vilified the Jewish community in I think, the federal court. He refused to stop, given a heap of chances. He just kept on spouting this crap. He was jailed for three months for contempt of court. Should people go to jail because they express deeply offensive, deeply hurtful ideas? Now, he didn't go to jail for what he said. He went to jail because he kept on saying it. Um, I might go first. Look, the answer to your first question for me is no. But, look, I guess I am a lawyer, so I can give the lawyer's answer by separating out the two. I mean, he, as you said, he was actually jailed for contempt of court. And ultimately, contempt of court is to continually refuse what a court has told you to do. So that could arise with almost any, um, but the any, action was speech. The action was speech, yes. Um, okay, well then we may have to amend my first answer because ultimately, I, I do agree that at some point in time, if you just simply refuse to obey what a court says, then ultimately there has to come in some means of enforcing it. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of exactly what was used to enforce it first, whether fines were tried first or whether, you know, some other. I think you would hope that um, jail really is the last resort. But it becomes impossible, regardless of what the law is. I mean, law was speech-related, obviously, but um, I, I think it's good not to lose sight of the fact that he was jailed um, for contempt of court. I mean, it's the same, I suppose, has happened with, um, uh, with Darren Hinch, um, again, for a speech act, for... Um, for failing to uh, abide by um, court rulings not to publish information about people, information which is felt to um, endanger those people. They're not the, they're not the most popular people in, in society. He has, I gather, named sex offenders. He's done this on a, on a number of times. He's gone to jail several times. So um, it does happen. It's not unique to Frederick Tobin. It's not unique to Section 18C. And ultimately, how can you enforce court orders 
I can actually divorce that in my mind. Um, uh, you know, the idea that ultimately, you know, ultimately you, you have to use jail eventually, but I do not know what was used against Frederick Tobin before he went to jail. I would hope it wasn't my first resort. Wendy, you're a journalist. Should um, somebody go to jail for speech? Well, look, I'd like, Sarah, would just like to talk about this contempt of court thing for a minute, because actually, you know, we, I didn't go too far into shield laws, but actually, you know, I don't rely on the state to protect my confidentiality of sources. And it could well be, and it could be happen to a lot of journalists, that you always know in your head that you could go to jail for contempt of court. You know, and that's part of what you actually say to people. Look, I'll go to prison, whatever happens here, if, if you're in that sort of situation. Also, uh, Darren Hinch has also gone to prison. Now, in his case, what he wants to do is be able to name um, child abusers, I think, when they're still before the court. Now, in that case, I would say I think the law has the balance right. I actually do believe people have to have a fair trial, and I think that is one of those rights that is difficult to balance against free speech. He chooses to go that extra inch, you know, he chooses to put himself in prison. I sort of do respect that to some extent as well. With the Holocaust denial, I have to, um, I, look, I think that really Holocaust denial is incredibly um, vilifying and hurtful to a particular community. However, I don't think, and of course I'm not part of that group, but nor am I part of the group that Andrew Bolt vilified. What Andrew Bolt did was in a contemporary circumstance, he vilified, challenged, published untrue things. Now, at least in the case of Holocaust denial, I would say at least it is about so much empirical evidence is available to contest it and to lay it to rest. It was to a far smaller audience. So, you know, if I was judging that case, I possibly would not have come down against Tobin. I would have come down against Andrew Bolt because he just flew in the face of any sort of um, accountability to the truth. Um, and so did Tobin, but I feel perhaps, you know, in that case, um, it was more easily laid to rest. But I could be completely wrong, and I'm not part of a group that was being vilified. Preferably, <coughs> I would like not to see any Holocaust denial around as well. Joe, can I put this to you, uh, coming on from what we've just been talking about? Offensive, humiliating um, speech. Isn't it better that ideas are expressed openly? Let, let, me, put, let me play devil's advocate here. Conspiracy theorists about, say, Jewish world domination or all Muslims are secret jihadists or all Indigenous people are after the taxpayer dollar. If, if you make this talk illegal, do you risk creating a, a festering perception out there that there really is a conspiracy operating? Shouldn't we let it, shouldn't we let it all just hang out and the, the stupidity of some ideas just let it go out there and, and, and burst into nothing. Not if you want to build a, uh, an harmonious society. Not if you want to, uh, to uh, you know, think about, if you like, you know, national unity, a country that's, as I said, made up of hundreds of uh, different languages, different cultures, then you do need uh, to have uh, certain, certain laws that says, that sends a message to the community that certain things are not okay, that certain <laughs> things are not okay. Uh, so, no, I don't think it would be, uh, you know, uh, right to let it all hang out because that would mean uh, the law of the jungle. And we would, I know myself, whenever I see, uh, you know, individuals and communities who are discriminated and vilified, it builds a hell of a lot of resentment. It builds a hell of a lot of resentment against the, the us and them, if you like, you know, and say, look, uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, after generation, often these groups are, 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 are discriminating not just the first generation, but the second and third, and it's consequently generations. And given that, I think that that's what the society has to agree upon, whether it wants to have um, a free go for all, or wants to ensure that we're building a society whereby there's respect for everybody. Having laws it means sending messages to, uh, to the whole society that certain things are not okay. Could you argue I, that? I, 
I, I for one, I don't believe that the laws, is, you know, a legislation stops people from being racist, or racist or, or, or being nasty to one another. No laws can do that. But the laws do send a message to the community that certain things are not right. Could you argue, though, that um, minorities' rights are best served in a society where there is robust conversation which can tackle difficult and uncomfortable issues? Under the present uh, under the group, uh, RDA, no one can, no, no one is stopped from, you know, genuinely discussing and debating all of the issues that need to be discussed and debated. There's only been very, very few cases. There's an Australian adage that says that if it ain't broken, don't touch it, don't mess with it. We have not seen groundswell of opinion within this country coming up and say, look, we want to change the RDA because it stops free, you know, free debate and free discussion. There hasn't been that. There hasn't been that. So why then take oh, sorry, when, so why take all that when uh, when when there's not that groundswell of uh, you know of, uh, of people coming up? I find that there's a contradiction. When uh, when there are genuine issues that people feel oppressed by, they have to struggle very hard to get those things changed. Often they have to struggle even by going to the streets, you know, mobilizing thousands, hundreds of thousands of petitions, and governments are very reluctant to act. In this particular instance, we only have a handful of people who uh, have been making noise about this law. Why is the government so quickly that we, you know, wants to change this? Sorry to interrupt, no, Joe, but I just wanted to add that I think it's really important for people to understand that Andrew Bolt would not have fallen foul of that law if he hadn't published false statements about people on the basis of their aboriginality, you know. And, and you only have to read the judgment to see that. And there's just been this deliberate campaign from the moment the judgment came out through the media lying to people about the meaning of this judgment. And just as I would say this whole more complicated discussion of freedom we're having now, which was found, for example, in the Finkelstein report, into the uh, independent media report, is just deliberately buried by the media. And I do think it's deliberate. And I do think there's tricky questions, but I think that at, at least you know, here we're having those discussions. Um, can I just add, um, just in relation to the examples you gave, I think one of the examples you gave was about Indigenous people. There have been articles about that. There have been articles um, about, you know, in fact, talking about the um, the alleged privileges that Indigenous people get, special prizes, etc., saying very much very similar things to what Andrew Bolt was saying in those articles. But it, it's often got lost in the mix that, um, you know, Andrew Bolt was unable to benefit from the existing defence because he, he, he published untruths about people. And I find it remarkable, um, Wendy mentioned this, that a lot of people, I'm not a defamation lawyer, a lot of people seem to think, and the, and the judgment even intimated that in fact it was defamatory. Why is it better for it to be defamatory than for it to be a breach of 18C? He actually suffered less consequence. I mean, de defamation leads to massive payouts and massive fines. I mean, what actually happened is, yes, the articles were censored in the sense that the Herald Sun can't publish them again, but when do they do that? When do they republish? You can actually find these articles extremely easily on the internet. And, I've, and I'm sure more people have read them since the judgment went beforehand. So if you look at the actual consequences of 18C compared to defamation, that's nothing. I might just make one more point about contempt of court. And just like to your, the, the, the thing you said about, well, he went to jail for a speech act. The fact is you can go to jail for contempt of court for parking tickets. I'm not sure that it's really fair to point out that, well, there's this law, and if you breach and breach and breach and breach, you'll, you know, because contempt is contempt. It is actually a different offence altogether. And it depends, you know, whether it relates to what I believe an unjust law, such as the shield laws, whether it relates to a just law. Contempt is a different thing. It's simply the act of refusing to do what the court tells you to do, and that can happen with a parking ticket. You've also, all three of you have spoken about sort of the wider societal context in which might um, limit speech, invisible factors um, that chill free speech, things like pressures from corporate advertisers and things like that. 
Um, Wendy, you also mentioned the new um, guidelines around what uh, civil servants can and can't do. And uh, look, there was a very interesting case last year, a lady called Michaela Banerjee. She was a civil servant. I think she worked in the public affairs department of the Department of Immigration. And by day, her job was to promote the position of the department. By night, she would tweet her criticisms of the Australian asylum seeker policies. Uh, under Sudan, by the way, so she wasn't identified. Um, uh, it's, it's a side issue, but what do you reckon, Wendy? Should, should, should she be allowed? She has been sacked, by the way. Um, but should she have been allowed to do that as, as a free speech kind of issue? Well, I would like to go back to the days of, um, I know it's a long time ago, um, but well into the late 1980s, as a journalist, you could ring a public servant and you could interview them. And people all the time were being quoted. And bit by bit, public servants have been uh, silenced. And I'm not the first to mention that it has got increasingly hard as a journalist to actually find out what people think. You know, I can't, for example, ring someone in the Crown Lands Department and find out, or the Liquor Trades Department, find out what's happening with the Bank of Bowling Club. It all has to go through these professional PR people who may or may not get back to you via several other people. It's completely unsatisfactory. So I would like to not only give people back the right to tweet in their own private time on their own private accounts, I don't think they should probably be doing it on their department accounts, but nevertheless, department people putting out a massive amount of PR all the time. So yes, I'd not only give them back their right to do their tweeting, but I'd give them back the right to speak to the media. Uh, Sarah, you mentioned in your talk uh, about the, the US intellectual property framework, um, and you described it as kind of more conducive to meaningful freedom of speech. Um, and I'm just wondering, how do you feel about that same US cultural headspace as it operates with the First Amendment, the right to free speech? And you pointed out that it prevents Australian-style anti-vilification laws. Is it consistent to admire that hands-off approach when it comes to IP freedoms, but also have concerns about uh, the hands-off approach when it comes to First Amendment freedoms? Um, I think that one can pick and choose parts of a culture, and I, uh, I mean, I, I'm a supporter of a um, uh, the fair use defence. Um, that and, and look, generally, I'm actually quite an admirer of a lot of First Amendment um, law from the United States. Uh, so I don't think it's inconsistent to support fair use for copyright and more flexibility, um, and not to, you know, absolutely adhere to absolutely everything from. Um, the American First Amendment, um, such as you know, unlimited rights to spend on um, elections and um, and you know, a constitutional protection for hate speech, you know, for the for the most vile speech of all. So I don't think that's a problem. What is a problem is that the U.S. is an intellectual property bully, and so whilst it has a pretty good uh, copyright law at home, it seems to be in free trade deals trying to enforce much more. Yeah, much stricter um, copyright laws on other people, which um, I, I don't, I honestly, I've done some work on free trade, I don't know how they expect to get away with that, but um, because the First Amendment at home actually does restrict how um, strong their copyright law can be. It's part of their, uh, dare I say, part of their cultural headspace <laughs> to, to, to yeah. bully smaller countries. Look, <laughs> let's now, um, open this on up. That note, <laughs> on that note, on that happy note. Um, let's now open up the conversation to questions. We'll have some, I think there's some people with um, microphones. Um, so we might have, we, we only have a short amount of time for questions. Um, but uh, look, uh, um, yeah, hi. Well, I don't know if it is working. My name is Marcus Wigan. The points that were just being made, which is a convergence between intellectual property law and freedoms, is one of the new nexus of power negotiation. Uh, freedom is about the balancing of power. The most critical area of all is communication. Unfortunately, with the surveillance processes and the ability to track back, we now have a situation where the commons of private speech, commons of data, no longer have much space. 
and it is the nexus of those three that is causing the problem. That is why Mr. Brandeis' uh, views seem to lose sight of the fact that there is a private space. If there is no private space, there is no freedom. And the public sector employees are now suffering from that construction. If those three issues could be slightly separated by the panel, I think it would help to clarify our understanding of this convergent nexus. Wendy. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I can adequately um, do what you're asking, but I do think um, the uh, invasion of private space by intelligence and surveillance and all of that sort of thing is a huge issue. And I can relate it to, for example, the right to protect your sources. That is the right to keep private the identity of people who maybe trust you with information that could very easily lead to the loss of their job or even potentially their life. And it's a very big concern now that, in fact, um, that information is, you know, and people are now learning very seriously. Younger journalists are, are seriously, and I feel very much with them, that you know, people are going to have to learn encryption at a very serious level if you want to practice um, journalism. I was very disappointed to see the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, Tanya Plebiscit, come out and support the sort of intelligence powers to, to access you know, our, our communications. I also think that um, this whole fair use and uh, copyright issue that Sarah has brought up, what I sense is that you've got the media companies and sort of, if you like, legacy journalists who don't understand really at the internet and also the way that many younger communication, both professionals and, and users, really just can see a whole lot of possibilities that could produce a more democratic public sphere. But as uh, it is a struggle now, and I'm sorry that doesn't quite adequately bring that nexus together, but I think the issues you're raising are, are particularly important. And uh, again, I think what we will see with Brandis and Wilson is that they will go back to their marketplace view of freedom and protect the property rights and the rights of business to make money at the expense of democratic rights. Uh, I do think that is, is what will happen. I mean, there is a battle to be had over the internet. Um, I mean, I won't add to Wendy, and I agree with your points about the spying aspect and the privacy aspect that there is a battle to be had over, and it's been raging in America, and we think it doesn't affect us, but so much of the internet goes through America and will affect us. This idea, um, what's it called, net neutrality, the idea of whether, you know, the property rights of the, of the um, you know, the ISP holders and whether they can, um, whether they can prioritise certain um, internet sites and, and therefore make other sites slower. They want that right. They say that's their property right, whereas I think that would be devastating for freedom of expression. That the digital place is a serious place for digital expression. And I think, just bringing it back to the contract issue, the contract in the public service, um, I think that really the, I would like the government to start from the premise that that this, you know, social media, the internet, is a fabulous new site for freedom of expression, which we would want everyone to enjoy as much as they can. And so to actually approach this from the point of view of how much restriction do we really need to put on our public servants? I can't talk about the Banerjee case because I, I actually followed her, but I can't remember, I don't know the tweets they were talking about. There is a problem if you're revealing secret information or whatever. There might be a problem if people know who you are and you're just continually saying the minister is terrible, I mean, whatever. But there is also a point, I mean, I followed her, I had no idea she was a public servant. What she was saying about the immigration laws was hardly unusual. Everybody is, you know, so many people hate the immigration laws in this country. And so the government could approach it from that respect, that the laws which stopped, which, you know, I'm intrigued by what you say about public servants used to be more able to talk to the media, but before they had to be much more proactive. Now it's very easy for them to publish, and I think the government should think, well, to what extent can we at least allow that rather than just shut it all down? Another question. Uh, maybe there's someone over on this side, yeah? And then we'll come over to this side, yeah. Um, hi, my name's Mary Ryan. I was just wondering if there was perhaps one or two things that you could 
suggest as a move towards a better balance of freedom in this country from an individual perspective? Could you hear me? We can hear you, I just don't okay. know where the buzz is coming from. Yeah, so if there was like one or two things that you could change to bring about better balance of freedom in this country, what would it be? And how could individuals sort of get involved in affecting or influencing that movement? I can answer the second part first, but um, I do. I, again, I would say um, spying aside, which is it's not a, it's not a, um, it's certainly not a non-issue, and I've been shocked at how much we said not to care about it. Um, I think there is actually, because of social media, there is a greater capacity than normal, and uh, for you know everyone to broadcast and change. Um, I think one thing that could free things up would maybe be a better balance of political choices. Because even though the two, the two parties, the two major parties seem to hate each other, they also seem pretty close in yeah. terms of actual policies. And so when, and at the moment, they seem to be the two alternative governments. And we're actually voting for what seems to be a fairly narrow range of options, in my view. Um, so that's one thing I could say. That there may be options for freedom. Like, for example, they both, they both are at one on oh, the issue of, um, of spying on the internet. Hang on, we might just um, turn off that microphone if we can. Joe, what do you reckon? Look, I, in the area that I, uh, I talked about, as I said earlier, I don't, um, I, I, I can only see that um, the things have improved from my experience, and that's why I gave a brief uh, background to my own background you know, when I first arrived here 40, 40 odd years ago, and um, the things have improved tremendously, so that uh, for me it's a, uh, to go back to good old days, it's a, it's a, a very worrying uh, thing indeed because it's not uh, improving things, it's actually sending messages to the community that it is okay to be a bigot. If I can use that, uh, that uh, term that the Attorney General used in Parliament in the Senate the other, the other day. So I would like uh, to see things staying as they are, not watering down the, the, you know, the, the, the RDA uh, because it has served this country very, very well. And until people make a case that uh, you know that that the current uh, RDA is not working, then I cannot, uh, I would not support. So I would, uh, I would be very worried if we actually turn back the clock. Can I can I just add something? Playing devil's advocate again, and it's coming back to something that Sarah said. You you were sort of implying that we need to kind of have, we need to be able to give people the ability to kind of play a, an active role in society, you know, the welfare system, um, you know, access to the media, all those sorts of things. If we do that, then can't we be more hardcore about freedom of speech? Because people won't be silenced and humiliated and vilified and offended. Well, e even if they are, they won't be silenced. And, and if you have lots of other mechanisms to keep people active, engaged, unalienated, then let's have freedom of speech. Well, one of the problems with that, Damien, is that that, that is a very long haul to get to that point you're talking about <coughs> right now, when, say, in Victoria, the protest laws, as I understand it, have just been uh, the capacity of people to protest. You know, like, yes, freedom of speech, but that that uh, means that people really do have to have the right to exercise, exercise it wherever they are. Now that is an issue that seems to me to be a current one. I kind of think it's very difficult to s select issues because it's an ongoing practice, but I would say particularly to younger people who, who in a sense inherit the internet, that um, really to be informed about these intelligence debates, you know, and, and we've had remarkably little debate about it in Australia, and also the TPP and the, and the appalling secrecy around that, when it's far more damaging, potentially damaging or not, than all this free trade stuff we're going on about at the moment. And so I would say, yes, pick your issues, but then really get involved and exercise a voice. You know, I suppose that's why I ended up with that example about um, actually enabling someone to speak. And I guess that's what Damien is, is in a way saying too, that I don't think we can sort of throw out 18C just because we're going to get busy on the protest laws. You know, it really is, uh, things are really connected. Um, in answer to your question, I would say yes. That if 
if we can get to a place in Australia where um, you know people are unlikely to be silenced by the sorts of by the sorts of speech which is targeted under 18C, and I've I have written in the past that I actually do have a have a problem with the offend and insult. But having said that, I can also accept that I'm. Um, not a member of a targeted group. I have not experienced the pain of racial vilification myself, so I come from that privileged position. I also can say there is a optical um, issue of, um, I think there's one thing to pass the law in the first place. I'm not sure it should have ever included offend and insult, but to get rid of it, you know, there is the optics of that as well. It's kind of, there is a, there is a message there being sent that that's okay. But anyway, my purest legal position is I'm not, I'm not that happy with offend and insult. But if we can get to the sort of, sort of society that you're describing, where people are unlikely to be, well, are extremely unlikely to be silenced by such speech, then I would say yes. That yes, I mean, the harm that such speech causes um, is just simply very, very unlikely to eventuate. But we don't have that society yet. And so as, as um, uh, Wendy said, it's a long haul to get to there. And I'm not sure that the first step is to absolutely decimate HNC, because that's what they're talking about. They're not talking about tinkering. They're talking, I mean, um, Joe described it, 18C, uh, well, it's going to be replaced by something else, but which, which, um, which is very, very different to 18C. And it's also, um, in fact, um, in that decision, um, I really looked at it today, actually, it, 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 he actually found that it intimidated. So he wasn't at the sort of yeah. easy end of it, the affair. He did so in fact, things. he said the things are sort of connected, and of course they are. And so, you know, I think this sort of technical thing, we want, that's not where we're going with this. Where we're going with this is to give one to God so that he can be, unleash himself even more than he already is about climate scientists and so many other groups. We have and time. race, he does talk about race yeah. a lot, no matter how much he says he's actually been silent. We have time for one more question. Uh, I think there was somebody, yeah, yeah. Thanks, I'm Adam McBeth from the Caston Centre. Um, so I, um, I wonder if, if freedom is going to be our new paradigm, um, the, sort of the most famous time that free, the freedom framework was used to, um, to talk about what we now consider human rights was probably Franklin Roosevelt's um, Four Freedoms speech, where he spoke about uh, freedom of speech, freedom, freedom uh, to worship, uh, but also freedom from want, freedom from fear. Where is the freedom from want, freedom from fear um, from this new paradigm that we see from George Brandis and, uh, and Tim Wilson? Um, and I, I wonder if you can comment on that. And it, freedom from fear in particular, I mean, freedom from want we can, we can understand fairly easily. Freedom from fear in that context was, was very much in a World War II context. Uh, in our society, freedom from fear um, is manifested in a way where by, by legal definition people are fleeing with a well-founded fear of persecution from their own governments. Um, and our response is uh, systematic mistreatment um, with a view to trying to deter them from, from, from fleeing, so to make their treatment worse than, than that which they are fleeing. Um, so I, I wonder whether um, you could give some comment on um, how, if, if we're going to embrace this, this freedom paradigm, or if we've got a, got a choice in the matter, um, could we not expand it to talk more about freedom from what freedom from fear? Uh, we'll maybe we'll just go down the line. I mean, I think um, I think we can expand it. I mean, you, you said as if we can. I think we can expand it. I mean, that's what we you know part of what this forum is about. And um, I urge everybody to, um, I suppose, put in your submissions about HNC. They're open until April, and then there's going to be the Law Reform Commission, which is a much bigger freedom audit. Um, I think, um, I mean, I've mentioned, I suppose, alluded to freedom from want. I'm now wishing I'd actually used that term. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> you could have said that earlier today. Um, but, um, so freedom from want is obviously, you know, I, I've referred to that with the welfare example. Um, and I totally appreciate what you have to say about freedom from fear. I guess the way freedom from fear is used by, frankly, both um, the, the current government and the former government is not to sort of, you know, it is not, it is to kind of, play on the idea of being afraid of the asylum seekers. I mean, now we've got the military fighting the asylum seekers, but also to play up freedom from terrorism, which, you know, is, is again, both sides are playing that up to, um, to justify why it's actually OK to be spied upon. So uh, I would love the debate to be expanded. And look, freedom from terrorism is also a, a freedom, but yeah, we should accept, accept that there is free, you know, that the asylum seekers are 
um, largely freedom, freedom from fear, and um, so we should accept that. And freedom from want is um, a great slogan that I'll be using all year now. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> and I think it's really um, excellent that the way you phrase it, the fact you've raised that, because I think just picking up from what um, Sarah said, and I think perhaps what I felt just even thinking through these issues in order to speak tonight is that what we need is not to go for this simplistic sort of slogan of freedom, which is going to be read in all different sorts of ways, but in fact to, to bed it down and, and to very much raise the, the link between freedom and economic rights. I mean, if you don't have a house or you don't, you know, and if you're fleeing from actual persecution and the result of that you get punished in the most appalling way to the extent one person losing their life completely, being murdered, um, well then, you know, what sort of freedom are we talking about? So I think, yes, it's, we've got to continue this conversation on and not get let them, let, when I say them, I suppose I mean Brandis particularly, uh, just pick and choose what freedoms he chooses to talk about. Joe, uh, we, uh, <coughs> the, the, the constituency that I represent, you know, that we represent at the, the PECA, is quite baffled by, uh, by the way that uh, all of this debate is taking place at the moment. So we're spending billions of dollars, virtually billions of dollars, on the, you know, on the, on the nine asylum seekers, they write to, uh, you know, according to international laws, and yet we're talking about, you know, make, you know doing a favor to, um, to one particular person, uh, you know. So we, you know, we're very baffled about this, this thing, that they, you know, they cannot believe that uh, the government is actually doing this. Um, and the, you know, this contradiction are quite obvious. I quite agree also with the statement, you know, the statement made by Sarah and Wendy. Uh, so I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it really makes a mockery of the, you know, the freedom of speech and all that sort of stuff. That's all we have time for this evening.